We got another video here um, that I'm making today. I'm going to go over a flutter as well as a fibrillation. So a stands for atrial, in case you didn't know, but there it is. It's more commonly called afib because it's a lot easier to say than atrial fibrillation. So uh, let's get to it. So um, we first kind of talk about. Uh, if I can get the slides, there we go. Um, the kind of the way things go. So uh, the mechanism, um, the rate, the ventricular rate. So the differences between the atrial and the ventricular rate, um, onset, termination, and then the patterns of conduction. So let's start here. So a fib, a flutter. They're both very similar to each other. Um, treatment is the same. Um, that's why they're kind of grouped together. Um, so it's considered a continuum of rhythm disturbance um, from a slower and more regular sinus rhythm to a faster and irregularly irregular rhythm. Um, so that's the, the buzzword, the hall, hallmark word is you're going to see irregularly irregular on all your board exams, whether it's paramedic, nursing, anything like that. Irregularly irregular is considered AFib unless proven otherwise. Um, a flutter, uh, it's also um, going to be grouped into the um, uh, arrhythmia category, but it's more regular um, in that your QRS complexes are going to lie um, about the same distance from each other pretty consistently, or pretty consistently, whereas the a fit, or, uh, atrial fibrillation is going to be kind of all over the place. And I'll show you here coming up um, in some of the EKGs. Um, flutter is really coarse, uh, where fib is actually can be coarse or fine, um, and by that um, we mean that you can either have really really small waves or you can have really really big waves. So, and again, we'll show you some of those here coming up. Um, it's kind of difficult to differentiate between the two, but really, as long as you can tell um, that there's something going on uh, that's not normal, then you're able to identify that hey, this person needs to be treated for this problem. So um, like we said, atrial flutter, generally regular, but it can also be irregular. Um, the atrial rate are usually around 300 per minute. So that means that the atria are contracting 300 times per minute compared to atrial fibrillation where they're actually going around 450 to 500 times a minute. Um, so um, that's also where you can differentiate them um, is by looking, kind of counting how many waves you're getting of the atria, so how many P waves you're getting, right? Um, so F waves are flutter waves, and this gives a sawtooth-like appearance. Um, and um, it's, you know, like we said, they're kind of uncommon, um, and it's a difficult rhythm to um, convert back to a sinus rhythm. You typically have to treat it with anticoagulation, um, but the uh, atrial fibrillation is the most common um, irregularity that you're going to see in America today. So here's a picture of atrial flutter. Uh, and this has what we call 2 to 1 AV conduction where there's two P waves for every QRS complex. Uh, it's kind of difficult to see um, in this version, in this lead. Um, the uh, What we mean by that is we have two P waves here in front of every QRS. Um, and uh, its most common uh, presentation is this, where it's a 2 to 1 AV conduction rate. Um, and if you notice, for every QRS complex, there are, you know, there's a, a P wave in between here. So um, if you think about kind of cutting the 300 rate in half, then you're going to get the ventricular rate of 150. So if we go 300, 150, so the vent rate is 150, but if we look up here, the P wave rate is actually double. Um, so that's how they get the 300 note, or 300 marker. Um, here's another uh, one. This is more of an older EKG. So we have our QRS complexes right here. We have one here, and we have one here. So let's count things up. So we have the starting at the QRS, so one, two, three, four, five. So we have five P wave slash QRS complexes per one QRS complex. So let's count again. So one, two, three, four, five. So this is a five to one ratio. 
Um, and our flutter waves, let's see, so we go 300, so they're around 300 per minute, which is pretty typical for atrial flutter. Here's another one. This is uncommon. This is a 3 to 1. So remember, we're 1, 2, 3. So um, for every 3 beats uh, that you're going to see with the P waves, um, you will have one QRS complex. Um, pretty uncommon, so you're not really going to see it like this. And to be honest, this 3 to 1 conduction stuff doesn't really matter much. Um, it's pretty much just scientific stuff. I sometimes even have a hard time differentiating it out because uh, things do get kind of jammed in there. Uh, the more common thing we're going to talk about here is AFib. Uh, so it's the most common arrhythmia in the United States. It's the board trademark name is irregularly irregular. Atrial rate 450 to 600 per minute, kind of like what I said, compared to the, um, the flutter, which is around 300. You can also have kind of intermediate rates, which is 350 to 500. It's not really that important. Um, it's most common in elderly patients, um, and it can be paroxysmal, which means it kind of comes and goes. However, um, there are studies that say the longer a patient is in constant AFib, the less likely you're going to get them back into a normal sinus rhythm. So um, once it's established, it becomes chronic, and that's not good because then we have to do chronic treatments, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So um, here is a patient who um, is in AFib, so you can kind of see that you have these little tiny things over here. We also have them up here. These are three separate leads. Um, so this top lead here is an example of AFib with a controlled uh, ventricular response, which means um, that the ventricles are contracting appropriately spaced apart, so they're not like 300 beats per minute. Um, the second one here is AFib with what we call RVR, um, which stands for rapid ventricular rate. So the rate with this guy is about, um, let's find an easy one to count here. So 300, 150, so it's around 120, which is kind of fast, um, especially if you're not physically active at all. Um, so um, this would be a candidate uh, for rate control um, versus a uh, rhythm control um, if he was um, you know, refractory to rhythm and rate treatment. So what we mean by that is when you treat AFib, um, you can either treat the rhythm, so you can try to convert it back into a sinus rhythm and use medications to help with that, or you can treat the rate where you give them a beta blocker or digoxin or some other medication that will help slow the heart down to prevent this uh, rapid rate. Um, this third one here is um, it's a AFib, uh, as you can see, and it's got a slow ventricular response. So this is actually, it looks like a ventricular escape rhythm, some of these contractions. Escape rhythms are when the heart's just going way too slow, um, that the ventricles just spontaneously depolarize. So. This one here in particular looks like an escape rhythm. Uh, here's another one. So this is coarse AFib um, with RVR. So the rate here is about uh, 200, maybe 150. Um, and then the bottom here, this is fine AFib. It's really hard to tell because the, the ink is so thick. Um, but it's got a slow ventricular response. Again, um, this top one is actually a flutter. And this bottom one is AFib, so the, it's really subtle to look between the two, um, but you can tell that the A flutter is more of a pointy kind of sawtooth, like this would hurt if this went over your skin. Or down here, this would kind of, it wouldn't necessarily feel the best, but it wouldn't cut you, it'd just be kind of a bumpy surface. Again, here's some fine AFib. This is a really nice looking fine AFib with a uh, low ventricular capture rate. Another one on a 12 lead EKG, this is also fine AFib. And notice how you're not really seeing it in lead one or lead two, um, but you see it in the precordials. So, and that can be common, so you gotta just make sure you check all of your leads, but you look here, you can see this irregularly kind of fluctuating um, electrical baseline, which is indicative of an AFib uh, heart conduction. 
Um, you can also kind of rare, um, you can see pre-excitation, uh, which is a fancy term for Wolf Parkinson White, which is essentially where you have a delta wave. Um, and I'm going to have another video on this here. Um, but essentially what this can do is this, if you go into this AFib long enough, you can actually convert into this SVT kind of rhythm. Um, and uh, that can actually um, be uh, converted again into a VTAC, which we have ventricular tachycardia here um, in these three leads. Um, but the most common thing you'll see is SVT. Um, due, it's due to an accessory pathway, and again, I'll talk about that in another video. So the main um, thing with treatment uh, for AFib is, like we said, um, there is uh, anticoagulation, there's antiplatelet, and then there's uh, what we call the chads VASC score, and I'll have a video on the chads VASC, but so we already talked about the rate control, so you essentially want to make sure the rate of the heart is not excessively fast, so you want to give them a beta blocker or digoxin. Um, I like using beta blockers because they, send, they seem to be a cleaner drug compared to dig, um, but each practitioner has their own opinion and they both work great. Um, and then you can also do rhythm control. Um, so you can try to give them a medication like amiodarone or propafenone or something along those, um, you know, class 1B or 1C uh, medications to help keep the heart in sinus rhythm. Um, and if both of those don't work, um, or if the rate control doesn't work, excuse me, if the rhythm control doesn't work and they're going to be in AFib chronically, then we need to treat them with anticoagulation therapy. So let's talk about anticoagulation therapy. So the most commonly used medication now is warfarin and coumadin. Now they're the same thing, it's just brand name versus generic name. So with warfarin and coumadin, they are um, vitamin K dependent, uh, or they, they work on the vitamin K dependent coagula coagula blah, coagulation factors. Um, and they actually um, will cause the patient to um, decrease the activation of the coagulation cascade, um, including protein C and protein S, um, and uh, will help decrease the chance of clots being formed. Um, so this is good because in AFib, you have chronic stagnation of blood in the atria, which leads to clotting, and then those clots can kind of fall down through the atria uh, into the ventricles and then be sent into the rest of the body causing strokes. Um, you can have infarcts of various things um, and both of which are not good. Um, the big downfall about warfarin and coumadin is you have to do blood checks when you first start off. You got to do like every other day and then every week and then every month. Um, it's uh, called the INR which is International Normalized Ratio. You want it to be between two and three um, the medication can be severely affected by um, your diet. So if you eat a lot of kale or grapefruit, actually, that can really mess with your levels of Coumadin warfarin metabolism. So you can either cause them to be not treated enough, or you can cause their blood INR levels to go over 10, which um, means they're essentially going to bleed if they touch anything or they get a bruise. Um, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, the good thing about it is uh, they're cheap. Um, it's been around forever. Um, but the uh, one of the really good things is that it's reversible. So you can give them fresh frozen plasma as well as vitamin K, um, and that will reverse the anticoagulation effect of those medications pretty quickly. Um, so if you have a patient come in like we did the other day uh, who had an INR of uh, 12 and they were uh, had uh, some rectal bleeding, um, and their hemoglobin was 5, um, you want to do what you can to reverse that anticoagulation as quickly as possible. The uh, newer treatment regimens are actually uh, called factor 10A inhibitors. So the most commonly ones that are used now is Xarelto and Eliquis. Um, these are just a once daily medication. You give it, you don't have to think about it. It uh, works differently than the vitamin K dependent um, coagulation factors. So this actually acts higher up on the chain. It uh, inhibits the factor 10A and uh, causes the patient to uh, not coagulate as they would. Um, so it's a much easier medication to take because you don't have to actually do any blood monitoring. 
There's a little risk of um, over treatment. It's just, you know, take the one pill per day. Um, the issue is with these is that um, to date, there has not been a way to reverse this if your patient comes into the emergency room with a fall. However, there are new medications out that are factor 10A inhibitors, inhibitors, so it's like a reversal agent um, that the ERs are starting to um, get you're provided with to use uh, for these patients who do have bleeds that need to be reversed. Um, the other thing that uh, patients use are antiplatelets, so aspirin, Plavix, um, you can use the dipyrimidomol, um, and those patients uh, are only going to be on aspirin if they have a chads vasque score of 1. So let's talk about chads vasque um, This is a um, scoring system that was developed um, to help determine the risk um, of a patient uh, having a stroke um, if they are in atrial fibrillation. So the chads vasque essentially counts like a mnemonic. So C stands for CHF. H is hypertension. A is age of 75 years or older, and that score, that actually gets two points. D is diabetes. S is stroke, TIA, or thromboembolism, and that gets two points. V is vascular disease, like peripheral artery disease, MIs, plaques, etc. A, the second A, is age, 65 to 74. And then SC is sex category. So females get a point. So um, anything over two or two and above, you need to be anticoagulated. If you're a one and below, you can go on aspirin. So most patients you're going to see who are in AFib um, are going to be elderly, so they're going to get at least one point. Um, some of them are going to be over 75, so they're automatically got two points right there. So um, theoretically, you can put them on the anticoagulation. Um, a lot of patients you'll see have hypertension, so that's another point, uh, as well as diabetes, so that's another point. So you're essentially just racking up the points that are saying, hey, probably need to go on some anticoagulation. So that's Chad's Vask, and I'll have a more specific video that will talk about that here um, in the uh, next couple of days. So hope uh, this video on AFib and Flutter has kind of helped uh, guide you along. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to shoot me an email, and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.